Please welcome co-founder and chief executive officer, social finance, Tracy Palangian. And your moderator, chief data scientist, Metis, and host, Outrageous Acts of Science, Deborah Barabiches. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to see so many wake up faces uh, <laughs> this early in the morning. I hope you're all enjoying MIT Solve. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and we have here uh, Tracy with us, and she uh, founded Social Finance uh, in the US. And so, Tracy, I wanted to ask you, you have an impressive background, you were in the private sector, and uh, you know what, what made you uh, go into social finance? And can you explain for people what pay for success, what that financial model looks like? Well. Um, Debbie, it's uh, wonderful to be here with you and, and, and to see all of you bright and early. First of all, I don't have such an exciting title like Debbie, Outrageous Acts of Science, but we, what we're trying to do at Social Finance uh, is fairly outrageous, uh, although it's gotten more mainstreamed over time. Uh, so Social Finance is six and a half years old. We were started um, at the end of 2010 uh, as a 501c3 with um, an audacious mission, uh, which is to mobilize capital to drive social progress uh, and specifically to mobilize private capital to solve a range of um, public-private partnership structures to, to improve lives of the most vulnerable folks. And core to that mission is the development of a tool called Pay for Success, or in its origins, the Social Impact Bond, which was pioneered by our sister organization, Social Finance UK, uh, in 2010. Um, so Debbie, may I spend a minute just to talk about what the Please. structure is? So at a very, very high level, Pay for Success uh, combines uh, several uncommon partners around the table to solve a common problem. Um, and uh, these include uh, private investors, uh, government, typically in the United States we work with state and local government. Uh, and finally, the third leg of the stool, which is an important one, is um, civil society, the nonprofit service provider actually touching the end beneficiaries. And um, a project typically starts with uh, a, a sitting governor or mayor asking an important question. How do I want to use this structure, this pay for success structure, to address one of my policy priorities, whether it's addressing public safety and re reducing recidivism, whether it's to combat the opioid crisis or address the homelessness issues um, or improving workforce uh, uh, development goals for, for hard to serve populations. And with that policy priority, we then go out and find nonprofits who are fantastic at um, uh, delivering programs to solve that problem. So I'll give you a specific example. And this is our first project back in 2013. Governor Cuomo in New York State wanted to use this pioneering tool to solve um, a, a very high recidivism rate in the state of New York, which, by the way, is, is a problem across the country. And for context, our country spends around $80 billion uh, locking people up. Uh, we have the highest population of incarcerated people in, in the world, 25%. Um, and uh, it's uh, just a, a very gnarly, persistent problem, and it's largely driven by a very high recidivism rate. So around 650,000 people are released uh, from U.S. prisons per year, and 60% um, uh, of those, right, uh, four, 400,000 of these people will recidivate back into the system within three years. So that's the context. That's the struggle that Governor Cuomo and his team were thinking about using this tool to address. So we went out and looked for um, a, a nonprofit service provider with a great track record. Uh, in this case, uh, an organization called the Center for Employment Opportunities. The acronym is CEO, which has a 30-year track record of taking people who are released from prison, give them basic life skills, and specifically job skills to help them enter back into the workforce. And, and they first go into what, what they call a temporary job, and then they'll be out in the open labor market getting a real job. Um, 
this program has been studied through randomized controlled trials with its efficacy. So with that program in mind, we then designed a program, and instead of having government just directly funding this program and, and scaling its operations, we actually recruited private capital, uh, investors uh, in this case partnering with Bank of America to help uh, get their high net worth individual clients to uh, put up, in this case, $13.5 million to scale the work of CEO in service of these goals of New York State. And, but this is the catch. If uh, this program is successful at, one, reducing recidivism of the people in the treatment group versus the control group, two, at, at achieving a high employment rate, again, between the treatment group and the control group, then New York State would repay those investors, their principal, and a modest rate of return. And if we do not achieve those metrics, then the investors stand to lose their money. This is great, and thank you, Tracy, for going into what types of projects can benefit from pay for success. So it brings up all kinds of questions, right? I mean, on the one hand, you're looking for high social impact projects so that yes. the investors will be interested in participating, right? Otherwise, government would just go and do them. You shared with me a statistic that I was not aware of. Uh, backstage, Tracy mentioned that Peter Orzak, who was uh, the head of the Congressional Budget Office, once, and he's a big supporter of supporter of evidence-based government once said or wrote in his book Money, Moneyball for Government that only 1% of fe federally funded projects are actually successful. And the metrics that most people have to measure success are just how many people the program touches. But it doesn't really uh, have metrics that d that are defined to really you know, have evidence-based support for saying it it reaches the people, but then it also gives them long-term success. So can you tell me uh, why, why, why is it that government is not, uh, what, what's the difference uh, in a government mandated and funded project versus a pay for success project? It's an excellent question, Debbie. And uh, yes, Peter Orzak did uh, cite the statistic in his book, Moneyball for Government, and it's very much part of the evidence-based uh, policy platform that many in Washington are championing right now, not least the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan. Um, and I think it's um, really important to think about how pay for success is different from normally government-funded programs. Um, pay for success, first of all, has the uh, feature of risk transfer that I just mentioned, right? Government are naturally risk averse, um, and, and funding programs that may or may not work um, could be quote unquote scary for, for politicians. So that risk aversion uh, we're trying to address through this risk transfer. You only repay or you only pay for the program and write a check after results have been achieved and measured and validated by an independent third party evaluator. So that's an important feature. Second uh, important feature is that by definition, in order to have a win-win win proposition, there's got to be something that is the economic engine driving this whole mechanism, right? And it's essentially about investing upstream, investing in preventative programs so that you avoid the long-term downstream remediation uh, effects, which are often more uh, expensive. And unfortunately, in, in our political cycle and, and the way we think about policy making, it's, it's very hard for even the most well-intentioned government officials to invest upstream and invest in those preventative programs because they're thinking, okay, if I invest in the this preventative program, what if it doesn't work? I have to pay twice, right? I pay for prevention and I pay for the downstream consequences of the prevention program not working. Um, and, uh, and, and finally, it, it's just um, really tough for governments um, to um, kind of help the apparatus to track outcomes uh, more, more intentionally than outputs. And, and Debbie, you mentioned right now people um, Often nonprofits are contracted on an output basis. How many people do you serve? What is your caseload, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of compliance heavy type of contractual arrangements rather than what happens to these people after you serve them one year out, two years out, what are their long-term life outcomes and are they on a path to, to economic self-sufficiency. So this tool, it's only a tool, uh, is trying to address all these things by aligning incentives and apportioning risk to the people who are more willing to bear it. So you mentioned something important. It ends up being more expensive sometimes for government to sponsor these projects. They could either go ahead and do it themselves or 
wait for the high-risk investor to have appetite and solve the issue much more effectively, hopefully. Can you share uh, some rate of success? It's a very, very young field. Um, so, uh, so I mentioned that the first project was launched in the UK in 2010, and even that first project um, is still ongoing. Um, as you can appreciate, these projects are anywhere between four and eight years in length because you need to have the time and the patience and the runway to see these fruits of uh, the, the seeds of prevention bear fruit, right? So by definition, because of the measurement process and because of the long tail of, of seeing prevention, they're, they're long term. So of the 70 projects now in 18 countries that have been launched, spanning a wide variety of issue areas from criminal justice to homelessness to workforce development to early childhood and beginning to have some K-12 applications, really, really exciting um, new piece of work that our team is working on around career and technical education in the high school space. Um, it, it, we have very, very few proof points. In fact, we published a white paper talking about the state of the field last summer, and last summer we only saw uh, one of those uh, 70 projects um, actually failed. This is the Rikers Island project in New York City. Um, that was the first project in the United States that we did not develop. Uh, that um, project did not um, achieve the predetermined outcome metrics, and government didn't pay, and uh, Goldman Sachs was the investor lost some money. So you can think of that as success or failure. It depends on, on the <laughs> eye of the beholder. But at that point in time, last summer, there were only four projects that have repaid investor principal, but it's still um, part of, you know, still on the journey to, to finish the project. So still a work in progress. Yeah. No, this is definitely a fascinating field. I, in preparing for this panel, because I admit I normally speak about uh, science and, and technology, so I had a lot to read, uh, I came across a blog in the social finance uh, blog portion that stated that somebody uh, called the social impact bonds that you just described immoral, stating that because they use human um, you know, challenging conditions and then design metrics over them and get capital from them, from, from those, they were sort of immoral and they're, they predict that, that going in that direction is almost like a, gonna take us to a mortgage subprime crisis, but of the social kind. What would you say about that? It's, uh, it's a criticism that we often get. In fact, we get many criticisms uh, along the spectrum. And uh, I love the provocative nature of this question. And um, it gets back to um, kind of you know, what are we trying to do here? We're trying to improve the lives of the most vulnerable people on the ground, and the status quo is simply unsustainable. Um, you know, whether it's, the I mentioned the people who leave prison that go back into the prison with no support when they leave prison, whether it's the half a million of kids that get placed into foster care system every year, or, or the homeless people, or, or can you believe that in this country only 5% of um, three-year-olds get high-quality pre-K and 25% of four-year-olds get pre-K. I mean, it's you know just preposterous, right? So you know, yes, the economists and me would say pay for success is the second best solution. Of course, government should target their taxpayer dollars to programs that work and get better results for our communities. But if we can think about new ways to work around the status quo that is not delivering results, you know, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Is It's really in the eye of the beholder. And I also feel like um, this idea makes people feel really uncomfortable because we're shaking a fundamental worldview that is held by many that you know you use your for-profit activities to pursue you know profits and then you use um, your kind of if you think about solving social pro problems you should think about using charitable dollars philanthropic dollars and and government and charity should be the sole kind of um, entities responsible for solving problems. And this kind of multi-stakeholder, very inclusive public-private partnership shakes that bifurcation in a very fundamental way. Wow, you mean you can make money and solve a problem? You know, for context, people making money and solving problems are completely aligned, right? Like it is through the, the life 
improvement and the flourishment of these individuals, whether it's getting jobs, not going back to prison, you know, dealing with their substance use issues, that investors get their money back, right? And and that um, that that kind of double bottom line win-win situation shakes that you know worldview, which is very uncomfortable and. Um, you know, it's a young field, and we've been in it for six and a half years, and some of our teams here, we have now 40 people, and over the last six and a half years, the journey has been a really interesting one, right? In the, beginner, in the beginning, there were people who were saying, oh my God, you know, how can this concept be so hyped, right? Like, just so much hype, so much excitement about it, and, 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 and then, like, now six and a half years later, especially in a very resource-constrained environment, we have to spend our taxpayer dollars more effectively, and Efficiently, you know that interest is sustained, and it's kind of kind of oscillated over the last six and a half years of you know hype and and declarations of you know morality and, and failure of this tool. So, the the way we like to think about this is that it's still an experiment. We don't know if it works, but we got to try. We got to use data more effectively to solve problems. And um, if in the world there. Are you know, one, one colleague of mine in the space puts it elegantly. He said, you know, they're haters, lovers, and doers, and we want to stay in the doer camp and, and see how it unfolds over, over the coming years. Yeah, I love that you're saying that because at the end of the day, you're just in the doing, and you're going to go and try to solve those problems. You're not against government or competing with government. You're trying to do it in a more effective way. In fact, if government were not at the table engaged in a very substantive way, these projects would not take off. Like, government engagement and collaboration is core to, to the construct yeah. of, of these projects. And I like that you mentioned data because, of course, if we don't have analytics and we don't uh, look at the numbers that support evidence, uh, the evidence that this is working, you know, it wouldn't, we would be doing a disservice to the government and yeah. taxpaying dollars. So, how do you find these projects? And you know, just going back to the private sector, we know that when you're a venture capitalist, a great rate of success would be even one out of 10 companies that you invest in having a huge uh, success. How do you find projects and what's the typical um, return on the investment, not monetarily, but the impact that you're expecting? Yeah, so um, Debbie, first of all, the, the data point is, is really important, and I just want to put a pin on it. So the, the data revolution is happening everywhere, and we're sitting at MIT, and you, know, you don't need to hear it from me, um, but specifically, the data revolution happening in the public sector is a really, really important movement. Um, uh, the, 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 um, Outcomes data is now present in these systems, and increasingly different agencies are able to talk to one another. Historically, and, and still a work in progress, by the way, you know, your HUD data is not tied to your labor data, is not tied to your HHS data, and, and we know that issues around poverty are multidimensional. These people, you know, a plight hit all these systems, right? So th there's a lot of effort to integrate these data systems across agencies, not just horizontally, but vertically, right? Like data hitting the, the city city, state system versus the state versus the federal system. And what we're hoping to do through this tool and many other tools is to use that data more effectively at targeting the population, um, both in terms of how to contract for services so that you can use data to contract more smartly for government, but also use data to manage the performance of these programs over time. And I think of um, using data like Waze, right? Like, you don't just contract and, like, the old map quest, right? Like, like you, you, you figure out a route and, and then you just go and you're on autopilot. No, you're looking at the data, what's happening to these people while the program is unfolding, is certain subpopulations responding better from this feature of the program, and then you course correct and, and evolve the program to best suit the needs of the population. And that ongoing active performance management aspect using data smartly is, is really This is part wonderful. Of what we do. Music to my ears as a data scientist. Our last question, because we're running out of time, is Tracy, what can the Solve MIT community do to get involved and to help? Uh, forward these problem programs. Oh wow! Well, we, we we're just getting to know Solve. I think it's such an exciting um, project, and you know the active verb of let's solve problems together. And I would love to 
Um, and, and first of all, like it, it's such an optimistic uh, word, and and this tool, I think, at the end of the day, is is an optimistic one. Like that, you know, finance and and government can be working together in service of society. So I would love to find more ways to explore, especially around the this idea of breaking down silos, having uncommon. Uh, partners working together to solve problems um, is, is something that we would love to engage this group. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Tracy, and thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks.